first topic will be by Dr. Sirish Kumar and he will be talking on uh, desmet stripic endothelial keratoplasty technique and uh, complications. Over to you sir. Uh, thank you Praveen. So my topic yes. is on uh, DSEC uh, technique and uh, complications. Uh, I think uh, we have two, three uh, uh, topics uh, on the same uh, subject. Yeah. So I'm just going to cover this in brief. Uh, so we all know penetrating keratoplasty is no more an automatic choice for the management of uh, uh, corneal diseases uh, which requires transplantation and uh, especially the endothelial transplantation. Um, so because of the inadvertent complications uh, which are associated with full thickness corneal uh, transplantation like uh, infection, suture related issues, uh, vascularization and uh, rejection which is much more common in penetrating keratoplasty as compared to uh, the endothelial keratoplasty and it's more prone for uh, injuries uh, and chances of uh, astigmatism is high. Um, so, what are the advantages of uh, DSEC over uh, penetrating keratoplasty? It's uh, the early and predictable uh, visual rehabilitation with minimal refractive change and uh, uh, the tectonic and structural integrity of the cornea. So, you are not going to disturb the contour of the cornea and uh, minimal su ocular surface issues as such uh, there are no sutures on the cornea. So, the chances of suture related issues are less. Uh, and fewer activity restrictions for these patients. So the surgical technique includes uh, donor preparation, recipient preparation, donor lenticule insertion and air bubble management uh, to oppose the graft uh, uh, in situ. These are some of the instruments which we commonly use for the management of uh, for uh, DSEC uh, procedure. Uh, and uh, the surgical procedure, uh, I uh, use uh, a disposable artificial anti-chamber uh, is a cutina instruments uh, uh, we can of course use it for uh, seven to eight cases uh, uh, without any problem uh, so then i use a guarded uh, knife to make a partial thickness groove at the limbus uh, which is around 300 microns so you can even go up to 400 microns uh, and uh, use a crescent knife uh, to make a small pocket in the uh, stroma of the cornea and then use my uh, blunt dissector which has a sharp margin in the tip and the side uh, it is a blunt uh, side uh, uh, lamellar dissector uh, once the dissection is uh, completed uh, I place it on the uh, Teflon block and uh, punch it uh, with the endothelial side up. So uh, the next is the recipient preparation. This is a case of uh, uh, DSEC uh, stage 2. The patient is symptomatic uh, with the few bullae on the cornea. I am combining it with the uh, fake emulsification. Uh, once the FACO is done, place the lens in, in the back and uh, then uh, strip the endothelium. Uh, you do this in uh, uh, certain patients, uh, not in all the cases, I do this adjustment stripping, uh, especially in fugues I do this uh, and for those patients uh, who have developed uh, uh, decompensation due to TAS because of the thick inflammatory membrane formation uh, on the posterior surface, uh, those cases I uh, remove the endothelial layer, uh, otherwise you can uh, directly uh, the graft on the uh, normal endothelium over there uh, and uh, the graft the reticule is separated uh, I use a sheets glide and I use a Sinsky hook to insert the graft into the antechamber and uh, place the air bubble this is the same patient a post operative picture on day one and two weeks and uh, six weeks uh, the OCT picture of the same patient. Uh, uh, 
you can even go up to 400 microns even 500 microns and create a thin lenticule uh, of course handling of this thin lenticules may be a little difficult uh, um, but uh, can be easily done I usually stain these uh, uh, thin lenticules uh, with the tip and glue so that uh, identifying these uh, lenticules in the anti-chamber uh, uh, will be easy and uh, manipulation uh, in the anti-chamber becomes easy. This is the OCT picture of the same patient and uh, the thickness of the lenticule here is uh, minimal, it is maybe a less than 100 microns. Uh, so the complications associated with the uh, DSEC in brief, uh, it is donor uh, dislocation, primary graft failure due to uh, traumatic uh, insertion of the lenticule, glaucoma, interface abnormalities and uh, infection of the graft or interface infection and rejection of the graft. Of course, rejection of the graft is uh, much less compared to penetrating keratoplasty. This is a case of uh, lenticule separation and dislocation. Uh, and of course, it needs to be repositioned. Uh, this particular patient is uh, taken up for the surgery. And uh, you can go to the interface with the help of a Sinsky hook. You can just uh, reposition the uh, lenticule and uh, inject air bubble uh, into the anterior chamber and uh, tamponade it this is the post-operative picture of the same patient uh, another case there is a separation of the graft from the uh, cornea and uh, there is fluid accumulation the graft is not dislocated or it is not subluxated but it is in situ but uh, there is fluid accumulation this actually this particular patient needs uh, intervention uh, many of the time it can uh, get absorbed spontaneously but uh, it's better we intervene and uh, inject air bubble and uh, remove this interface fluid by what is called venting incisions uh, uh, in the paracentral cornea and uh, milk of the fluid uh, from the interface So this is the same patient, a post-operative picture after uh, six weeks. Other complications like um, uh, pupillary block and shallow entry chamber or flat entry chamber uh, or uh, graft failure, graft uh, rejection can occur uh, with the DSEC patients. But a careful selection of these patients and uh, uh, following a proper technique can result in an uh, optimal outcome. Thank you very much. Uh, I have one more presentation in this same session. Can I combine? Uh, can I go ahead? In the same session, do you have? Yes, yeah, yes. Region management. Yeah. Yes, you can. Can I? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Sirish will be continuing with uh, his next topic. Uh, it will be on terrisium management, uh, current concepts. While he preparing any doubts uh, regarding the previous uh, talk? So, do I have some questions? Sir, yeah, please. Sir, yes. you can ask yes. the question. Uh, it is uh, definitely uh, uh, difficult uh, complications, uh, but uh, uh, like while inserting itself, I think uh, we should take care uh, uh, and uh, see to it that this complication doesn't happen. Once it is uh, uh, it's reversed, if it is uh, placed reverse in the anterior chamber, it's very difficult to manipulate in the anterior chamber. If it is slightly a thicker graft, if it is a thin graft, we can always uh, uh, manipulate on the surface, ocular surface, and uh, try to reverse it. If it is a very, uh, if it is a thick graft, more than uh, 150 microns, it's a little difficult to manipulate in the anterior chamber. Before, before you uh, separate the, the graft from the donor, uh, 
uh, what we do is while it is still endothelial side up, you take a marker pen and you put a dot at one place, uh, say at six o'clock, imaginary six o'clock, and you put an arc across three clock hours or at the nine o'clock. So when you put it in, it has to be, the arc should be on your left and the dot. So yeah. that always helps to tell you which way it is. If the arc is on the wrong side, then you know. So in yes. these graphs where you can't have a S stamp or an F stamp, that is how we do it. Something similar to do what we do in NDMAC, uh, but uh, uh, how do you reverse it, sir, if it is a thick graft in antechamber? Uh, if it, you have to do it with irrigation, so you yes. go on, uh, irrigate one edge and you with a strong irrigation, it will take place. I'll try to and then uh, you always lose some cells. In that, yeah, in that process, you lose some cells, yeah. Thank you. So in manual DSEC, uh, because of the cuts you have with the crescent, you can ad identify the stromal surface. Yes. Uh, exactly. In the microkeratome uh, uh, dissection, it's difficult to identify, so you need to mark it. But in case of manual dissect, because of these serrations which we have on the stromal surface because of dissection, you can see while inserting also that uh, graft is on I correct usually, orientation. Uh, from our side, there may not be any problem while inserting. Uh, if at all it happens in uh -huh. the antechamber, uh -huh. maybe little bit. Then, then you can take it out, exactly. see the serrations, and you can insert it again. Yeah. Yeah, it, <laughs> it, it, but once the, be very it comes to out, the then uh, yeah. So, uh, the my next topic is uh, management of uh, terrigium, current concept. Uh, uh, so, we all know terrigium surgery has been performed for more than uh, 3,000 years so from the days of uh, Tsushita. And we have uh, uh, more than 60 surgical procedures uh, described. Uh, for management of terrigium. However, uh, we are not sure which uh, uh, surgical technique uh, is the technique of choice for a particular type of uh, terrigium. Uh, the chief goal of uh, this terrigium surgery should be uh, the prevention of uh, recurrence and the uh, surgery should create a limbal barrier so that there is no conjunctivalization of the cornea with uh, minimal or no complications uh, and uh, it should be cosmetically acceptable to both the patient as well as to the surgeon. So in order to achieve this uh, goal, uh, we should remove all the uh, reactive fibrovascular tissue, eradication of all mutant terrigium cells, restoration of a smooth surface, uh, which is easy to re uh, and uh, restoration of normal limbal barrier. So terrigium uh, uh, surgery uh, actually uh, ocular surface transplantation procedures uh, have been found to be very effective in the management of uh, terrigium uh, and uh, 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 surface transplantation and its modifications like conjunctival autografting, conjunctival uh, limbal autografting, conjunctival tissue graft from the terrigium itself and amniotic membrane transplantation have been found to be very effective in the management of uh, terrigium. Coming to primary terrigium, we have various options that are available uh, for us and uh, conjunctural autografting has been the gold standard in the management of it. Uh, uh, just uh, a small uh, video, I think uh, uh, most of us are following the same technique. I usually inject uh, uh, lignocaine subconjunctively and uh, so it helps actually the patient can cooperate uh, for the surgery. Uh, and the uh, terrigium head is the worst and uh, the uh, fibrovascular terrigium tissue is uh, excised. Uh, we usually aim for uh, 3 millimeters uh, uh, clearance from the limbal margin that will create almost 5 millimeters of uh, uh, bare sclera uh, roughly because of the elastic recoiling of the conjunctiva and take a graft from the superior or superior temporal bulbar conjunctiva and uh, usually inject uh, lignocaine subconjunctively uh, to separate conjunctiva from the underlying tenons and take a thin graft. Uh, and uh, uh, place it uh, <coughs> on the base clear bit. Either glue it or uh, suture it. 
and uh, so amniotic membrane uh, has been tried uh, and uh, many surgeons are using it uh, for uh, management of primary pterygium uh, and it's been found to be effective in the management of primary pterygium uh, it is as good as uh, conjunctival autografting if uh, amniotic membrane is available we can use the preserved amniotic membrane uh, and uh, there was a study which compared conjunctival autografting uh, uh, with amniotic membrane transplantation. It was found that uh, for primary pterygium, uh, uh, both work uh, well, but uh, for recurrent pterygium, uh, conjunctival autografting is uh, efficient, but uh, amniotic membrane alone is not sufficient. And uh, if the uh, conjunctiva, superior bulbar conjunctiva is not available, uh, so we can, uh, in case of a patient having a glaucoma filtering blep or a glaucoma suspect, so in whom the superior bulbar conjunctiva may be needed for future filtering surgery, or a patient with a double head pterygium where uh, you have a large vascular defect on either side, so your superior bulbar conjunctiva may not be sufficient to cover the entire uh, vascular defect. In such cases, uh, we can take graft from the pterygium tissue itself, conjunctival tissue from the pterygium. Uh, uh, I've been trying this uh, procedure for the last 7-8 years uh, with good results. Uh, so even though it is little difficult to obtain a uh, graft from the pterygium tissue, but uh, it can be taken. It is actually thick compared to the normal conjunctiva. It may be around 8 to 12 layers of uh, thickness uh, compared to the 4 to 5 layers of uh, normal conjunctival thickness and can be placed on the uh, base clearal bed and uh, uh, either sutured or uh, gl uh, glued and uh, we have published this uh, particular technique in uh, IJO uh, in 2018. Uh, the results were uh, uh, very good uh, uh, with the, the recurrence rate of 4% in 87 patients uh, uh, which were included in this uh, study. And double head pterygium is a little difficult management problem. It's because of uh, uh, the large base clearal area to be covered. So you have various options available. Conjunctival autografting, we can take graft from superior and inferior bulbar conjunctiva and uh, uh, place uh, these grafts on the base clearal bed on either side. Or you can uh, take a split conjunctival autograft uh, with and without uh, limbal orientation. Uh, we have tried even without uh, limbal orientation, it works and uh, conjunctival tissue graft which I have already described uh, from the same pterygium can be used to cover the uh, same base scleral defect. So this is uh, a demonstration of a superior and inferior bulbar conjunctival graft. Uh, it's little difficult to obtain a graft from the inferior bulbar conjunctiva uh, but uh, can be taken. Uh, there is a tight adherence of uh, uh, tenons to the uh, conjunctival tissue there uh, inferiorly. And uh, uh, so this is another case uh, where I am demonstrating vertically split conjunctival autografting uh, uh, with the limbus to limbus orientation. If you have a large donor area uh, superiorly, you can split the graft into two parts and uh, you can still maintain a limbus to limbus orientation and uh, place the graft on the base clearal bed. It uh, works very well uh, and uh, you can even split the graft uh, horizontally uh, if you require if you have to resurface a large area uh, you can see here is a large defect on either side you can split the graft into two parts uh, horizontally and uh, place the graft i'm just taking a thin uh, limbal block of uh, tissue from the uh, peripheral cornea because the nasal uh, uh, pterygium was a recurrent pterygium. I thought uh, uh, including a thin block of limbal tissue will uh, uh, prevent uh, recurrence. Uh, of course, uh, there is not much difference between a simple conjunctival autograft and simple uh, limbal conjunctival autograft. Uh, another case is almost grade 3 uh, double head pterygium. Uh, uh, you have uh, a large uh, pterygium and a large vascular defect to cover, uh, so your superior bulbar conjunctiva may not be sufficient. If you have amniotic membrane, it is ideal, uh, but if it is not available, uh, so you can split the graft uh, into two parts and without uh, uh, orientation, without limbus to limbus orientation, you can slide the graft down and uh, place it on the base clearal bed. Without, uh, if you see here, uh, uh, this is the limbal end, this is the cut end. Uh, 
even without uh, orientation you have to just create a, a barrier there uh, this uh, works i have been doing this uh, procedure for uh, quite some time now more than 7 uh, years uh, with good results and even i have published it in uh, uh, ijo uh, and the results are uh, excellent with this technique in double head region 90 cases have been uh, uh, operated and uh, the uh, we had four cases with the recurrence and another uh, uh, study was uh, uh, published in uh, ojo women journal of ophthalmology and uh, recurrent terrorism of course is a difficult management problem you have these options available mitomycin c conjunctival autografting amniotic membrane transplantation and uh, conjunctival limbal autograft mitomycin c 0.02 to 0.04% uh, uh, sir sir tiny time is yes. over sir okay last i'll summarize uh, so 0.2 uh, 0.02 and 0.04% been told 7 minutes we can thank you okay so limbal conjunctival autograft versus mmc both are equally effective in the management of uh, recurrent terrorism and uh, there is no difference in the intraoperative and postoperative mitomycin c for recurrent terrorism but uh, one should be prepared to handle these complications when they are using mitomycin c thank you very much so thank you sir for the positive of the time uh, we'll go to the next uh, next you. topic sir thank you thank you i think even for primary terrorism amniotic membrane is more recurrence than autograft the another factor more compared to conjunctival yeah. autografting uh, it's around 10% uh, uh, as compared to uh, conjunctival autografting where it is around 3 to 5% Yeah, Thank I think you. other than graft, the main uh, important factor for preventing recurrence will be how meticulously you clean the tenons and how thin graft you take. More than AMG and uh, conjunctival autograft. not done but the, i feel the meticulous cleaning is the mo most important thing uh, for prevention of recurrence So the next topic will be by Dr. Pratik uh, Diotia, and he will be speaking on uh, manual DSEC technique of uh, endothelial keratoplasty for uh, beginners. Good afternoon, everyone. So some of the details of the topic were uh, taken care by the previous speaker. So I will uh, skip some of the slides. So. cornea is basically a anatomically layered structure so we do we know that the cornea has five layers but now we have yes. dr dua with ourselves and he has highlighted the importance of the sixth layer that is dua's layer and cornea is maintained in a state of detergence by endothelial cells sodium potassium atpase and by tight junctions between endothelial cells so The, the average human endothelial cell density decreases with age and there is an average cell loss of 0.6% per year so normal healthy cornea needs good endothelium count so to get a, a good orderly arrangement of collagen fibers so that it remains transparent once the cell count drops to below 700 then the chances of uh, corneal decompensation increases and we get uh, symptoms of bullous keratopathy so keratoplasty uh, is a condition where we uh, uh, do full thickness cornea transplantation and we remove the diseased uh, host cornea with a healthy donor cornea and we can classify it into penetrating keratoplasty and lamellar keratoplasty and lamellar further classified into anterior and endothelial keratoplasty so i will be speaking today on dissect so uh, the indications are endothelial dysfunction and corneal edema 
and absence of visually significant stromal scarring. So conditions such as fuchs endothelial dystrophy, PBK, affected bullous keratopathy, failed penetrating uh, keratoplasty and eye syndrome are the indications. The advantages were taken care of uh, by the previous speakers. So I will just show you my case and how I do manual dissect. So the donor corneoscleral rim is uh, uh, mounted on an artificial anterior chamber and you can just scrape off the epithelium. Then dissection is carried out with blunt dissectors. I usually use uh, the dissectors which are uh, provided by Indo-German. So they are of two kinds, one straight and another one is slightly curved. So once the dissection is done, then you can uh, start the surgery, mark the uh, central 8 mm of area with the trephine, then you can uh, dissect the diseased uh, decimate membrane over the marks area, take out the decimate membrane and then the lenticule which was dissected is capped with endothelial side down and pushed over sheets glide. Then carefully while holding the lenticule you can just take out the sheath slide. You can wash the little bit viscoelastic and then inject air to get good tamponade. So this is the end of the video and this is the pre and post op outcome of the same patients uh, visual equity improved to 20 by 100 by one week and these were the ASOCT pictures of the same patients and at one month post of the visual equity improves to 2030. So you can have some complications such as in this case we can detect that there is uh, endolenticule detachment and uh, you can uh, confirm it by anterior segment OCT and after rebubbling the endolenticule uh, was attached and this was again documented on ASOCT. You can also do DSEC with IL exchange and these were the pictures of the same patient. So there are significant technical and surgical challenges which are involved in performing lamellar micro dissection of a tissue which is only 500 micron thick and recent advances in surgical technique, benefits of a more controlled surgical procedure and improved graft survival rates have resulted in a shift away from conventional PK. Thank you. So thank you, sir. Uh, so it was uh, well described. So we have, uh, we'll, for the paucity of the time, we'll go to the next topic again. Uh, so Dr. Ritu Arora will be speaking on DSEC in complicated situation. <laughs> In the meanwhile, sir, uh, first uh, I have a question, sir. No, no, I so I have a question. Uh, yes. So in uh, in the video you have seen, uh, shown, uh, you did not suture it. Uh, no, uh, with the, if I am creating a scleroconal uh, pocket, I don't suture it. You don't it. suture it. No. So, but is there any risk of uh, lenticle coming out uh, mm. from the section uh, while? If if you are careful, usually scleroconal pockets uh. they are uh, quite secure. But in, in case if I am doing clear corneal dissection uh, yeah. and making an incision which is slightly um, larger in size yeah. three or more, then I su always suture, suture it. Okay. Yes. But for the beginners, it will the idea. Yeah, it, be it will be better, better that if you su suture. Yes. Cricket on my own. We have a micro cricket. So we order cricket sometimes. But uh, here in CFS, we have got a Moria. Oh sorry, this one. Uh, ML7 micro cricket, which can cut. So I'm 
making free cut on that with automatic dispatch. But sometimes you get free cut from LVPO and short is the distance, short check is also. Manual, yes, yes. Manual is much more comfortable. Yeah. But length, thickness, and yes. मैं अपना कनेक्टर दे दूँ? लिया? Yes, since last five years. Last? Five years. I left Muradabad in 2010. 2015, sir. Five years. Five years. Five years. Currently, it's different places. Your connection is from? My hometown is Gurgaon. So, this is a very cutthroat market. So much availability of doctors. So, it's better to stick to it. Where are you going? Gurgaon and Southern Union. Three days here, three days. So, you need to go to this? Both places are both better this year. What do you do? We have our own item, but the collection is not good. How will it go? Is it Mac compatible? So you get content and then you will not go? No. So we get tissue suitable for endothelial protocols to reduce this level B. And then we choose the tissue we have. Shaw Charity was giving free cut, so whenever I am travelling to other centres, this machine is not available. Then I get free cut tissue and I have to discuss it. And the other is only for free cut you got this machine? What keratin and free keratin you do? It's ML7, so it has two heads, one for LASIK and other for the LASIK. So LASIK you use? Yes, the same method that we use for this. We are giver. Sayyid Maaz has got the same which he got the same way. It's German item. Someone, Praveen was doing some research. He came back to Vani Jawad Jawani. That you will use. You are so comfortable with manually. Yes. Finally, now a force player gave the level DMV student a course. This is unknown versus microphone. There are not many RCT. So that's why I gave her at least forcefully will do it. The technician is not doing it. They are not using it. Somewhat like other than predictability, they are very comfortable with the microcaratum, with the thinner. And I don't know, somehow in the back of my mind, it is always the technician will not make any sterility. We use the cuts here and there. And my always fear is that. That issue is there. Yes. I used to call to OR. But I think the technician in Shroff has been trained at LVPR. I used around 7 or 8 people from them. And that punch now is completely eccentric. So Dr. Kamrul Hassan Khan will be presenting on effect on corneal endothelial cell count and uh, central corneal thickness after phaco emulsification in difficult cases. So, these are the disadvantages of Apple. Uh -huh. <laughs> 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 yes. 
Am I audible? Yeah. Good afternoon, respected chairpersons. Uh, first, I express my thanks and gratitude to All India Ophthalmological Society. I am Dr. Kamrul. I am working in a military hospital in Combined Military Hospital, Dhaka. I will be talking on effect on corneal endothelial cell count and corneal thickness after phacomalcification in difficult cases. Can I know my timing? Yeah. How much is the time? Six, six, six to seven, six minutes it will be better. Okay. <laughs> One minute for discussion. <laughs> what happened? Again? Yes. Currently, phacoemulsification is the standard surgical technique used in the developed world. Higher EPT and CDE values are the known to be the associated with an increased risk of corneal endothelial cell injury intraoperatively and corneal edema postoperatively. All of you know as the cornea is a transparent avascular tissue with a smooth convex and outer surface. A cataract surgeon, we want to see a happy patient on the first postoperative day with a clear cornea, white eye and a central intraocular lens. However, to achieve this satisfaction is quite challenging. All cataract surgery, even perfect surgery, does some changes, damages to the endothelium. And this is the anatomy of the cornea, all of you know. Why postoperative edema occurs? The phaco bone, excessive postoperative inflammation, prolonged postoperative intraocular pressure, toxic insult by the fluids, Preoperative decreased endothelial cell count, elderly patient, prolonged operation time when large number of cells damaged during the surgery. Thickness of the cornea can be changed and endothelial cell count may be vary in any kind of cataract surgery. In case of difficult cases, these changes are more prominent. During this high skill procedure, some amount of corneal endothelial cell damage and thereby alteration in the corneal thickness always is a consequence. But if the endothelial cell counts comes below a critical level, it may cause corneal decompensation and vision loss. Aim of the study was to investigate the amount of endothelial cell loss and changes in corneal thickness during phacoemulsification, particularly in the difficult cases. Following were the difficult situations we catered during phacoemulsification. First one is the herd nucleus, next small people, shallow anterior chamber depth, posterior polar cataract and intraoperative floppy iris syndrome. Preoperatively, pre preparations taken, complete ocular examination, fundus evaluation, intraocular pressure, proper biometry, corneal endothelial cell count and morphology by specular microscopy, look for endo any endothelial dystrophy. We excluded the cases which had ocular trauma, ocular surgery, history of ocular inflammation, any corneal pathology, endothelial cell count less than 2000, and any intraoperative complication, particularly PCT. We excluded all these cases. Power operative precautions, we checked proper dilatation, though the small people it was not dilated. Eyeball was in adequate softness, uh, application of dispersive OVDs, reapplication of OVDs whenever required, changing of phaco pattern depending on the situations, high irrigation aspiration results, turbulent flow and air bubbles, these are also uh, controlled during surgery. Maintaining a proper position of the phaco probe sleep, that is one of the most important issue. Emulsification of the fragments done within the papillary plane. Smooth trains to avoid sharp fragments. You see some sharp fragments sometimes causes damage to the endothelium. Proper cleaning of the OVDs and in bag eye well implantation. Phaco parameters, it was uh, taken according to the surgeon's comfortable comfort. Method studies was carried out on patients underwent cataract surgery and combined military hospital Dhaka between June 2018 to July 2019. 
preoperative evaluation, everything was done accordingly. Pachymetry, particularly and specular microscopy, was performed one day before the surgery and first postoperative day one month and three months after the surgery. All patients underwent cataract surgery with phacomulsification with intraocular lens implantation by the same surgeon using infinity phaco machine. During pre- and post-operative evaluation, central corneal thickness was measured by pachymetry and endothelial cell count measured was by specular microscope. This is a surgical video. I want to skip this one due to time shortage. It was done on the one day before surgery and first post-operative day one month and again three months after surgery. Both procedure was performed by well-trained ophthalmic assistants. Along with other parameters, the above data was collected and statistical analysis was done using SPSS students and Wilcoxon tests. These are the charts showing hard nucleus 11.6%, floppy iris syndrome 42.7% among the uh, uh, surgeons, uh, uh, the same sample size. Posterior polar cataract was 17%, small people 19 and shell AC was 8.73%. Pre-operative -oper complication, there were a little bit of complication, iris damage was in few cases, posterior post capsular tear was in few cases and nucleus drop in one case and I will drop in one case. Results, a total number of 424 eyes of 350 patients, no ma male families accordingly, among those 84 eyes was leveled as difficult cases. There were moderate loss of endothelial cell count and significant swelling of corneal thickness on first postoperative day. Preoperative corneal thickness restored after three months in most of the cases. This is the corneal thickness changes. You see in the small people, uh, the, the preoperative and then day one, day seven, first month and third month. Accordingly, floppy iris syndrome, then the hard nucleus, the shallow interior chamber and posterior polar cataract. And these are the endothelial cell density. You see preoperative and first uh, postoperative uh, one month there yes, was sir, a significant yes, difficult yes, uh, around 41 last minutes okay so oh, we, we found a significant de uh, uh, decrease in the endothelial cell count so endothelial cell count is uh, uh, always uh, decreases in any sort of cataract surgery but particularly those we level as a difficult cases the parameters used by the surgeons according to his com comfort ultimately it has shown that it normal other than normal cases it causes a significant decrease in the endothelial cell count as well as the corneal thickness but corneal thickness ultimately after three months we found it comes to its normal position so the take home message the phacomulsification causes significant corneal endothelial damage particularly in the difficult cases. But if the numerical density does not fall below the threshold value, cornea maintains its normal transparency and visual outcome remain satisfactorily even in difficult cases. These are the references. Thank you very much for your patience hearing. So the next, the next talk, Miran, are you ready? Yeah, we can start, yeah. So meanwhile, sir, one question, sir. Please. Uh, uh, while uh, doing these hard cases, uh, do you calculated the CDE and whether you compared it with your central corneal thickness? Uh, actually, uh, we definitely, uh, we uh, marked the CDE, accumulated dissipated energy, uh, and uh, though I did not show it here, but definitely we con con so consider this thing. So you feel that uh, the higher the CD value will have a more endothelial damage? Definitely, yeah. definitely. So we try to uh, do it, and the particularly in the hard nucleus, we try to do it in the direct job method so that less yeah, amount less of FACO CD is used. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm sorry I wasted a lot of time, but... Uh, my topic is on DSEC in complicated uh, scenarios. So I'm going to run you through some of the videos which are little unusual conditions needing DSEC. The first, one, first situation is when I've done DSEC in a case where I had trauma, Pele video, video, where I had trauma and had had a scleral fixated aniridic IOL and with bullous scleropathy. The second case I'm going to show is where I did the DSEC in a case of PBK with the IOL which was malpositioned, haptic was in front of the iris, you know. 
एंड थर्ड वीडियो इज केस ऑफ अ ट्रामा दिस इज अ केस आई एम ट्राइंग टू शो यू ये लाइट बंद कर दो तो ठीक है अ केस वुड विच हैड हैड अ ट्रामा हैड हैड सूचरिंग डन समवे देयर एंड हैड एन एन आई रीडी कायोल सो माय माय टेक्निक इज दैट आई मेक अ टेम्पोरल टनल एंड आई टेक द साइज विच इज थ्री मिलीमीटर लेस देन वाइट टू वाइट मार्क माय साइड पोर्ट्स एंड आई ऑलवेज पुट अ ए सी मेंटेनर इन साइड इसमें कुछ वो है नहीं क्या ए सी मेंटेनर इन साइड एंड आई यूजली आई यूज अ ट्वेंटी फाइव गेज ट्वेंटी फाइव गेज इन्फ्यूजन हेयर आई हैड अ प्रॉब्लम दैट विच आई डिट रियलाइज ओनली आफ्टर आई स्टार्ट डूइंग द सर्जरी दैट देर वर सूचर्स प्रेजेंट ऑफ द आई ओ एल विच वॉज फिक्सेटेड सो आई हैड टू चेंज माई साइट फ्राम ट्रेडिशनल नाइन ओ क्लॉक आई हैड टू गो सुप्रो टेम्पोरल एंड आफ्टर दैट आई स्टेन सो एज टू यू नो मार्क द एंडोथिलियम हेयर द डेस्मस वॉज कार्ड आई कूडेंट रिमूव इट कम्प्लीटली एंड आफ्टर दैट आई इंसर्ट देंटिक्यूल विच हैज बिन ऑटोमेटेड प्रिपेयर आई रिमूव माई लेंटिक्यूल इन दिस मैनर सो दैट आई हैव नो ट्रामा एट ऑल एक्चुअली एंड विद अ थर्टी गेज नीडल आई जस्ट पुश देंटिक्यूल इन and gently trying to secure my lenticule in with the sutures i close my tunnel and i use a c3f8 gas in that because there was no iris diaphragm c3f8 non expensile concentration and i definitely suture all my side ports because i want no leakage this keeps me secure i remove the next day and after that i do iron it out so as to remove the uh, interface fluid if at all this is a second case which has got a iol you can see iol is has got a haptic in front of the iris i wasn't too sure whether pc was intact or not ubm did not really reveal the um, uh, reveal the uh, pc status so in this case after mm, you know uh, we i got the iol in the ac did a desmes scouring again the desmes you can say uh, this is not normally the way i do this thing but it was very scarred there was a premature entry i had gone superiorly in this patient i removed the original iol from this patient and though there was no vitreous there was no vitreous and then i fix put a retro fixated iol in this patient so this is a retro fixated uh, iol and uh, i dipped the iris through both the claws on the posterior side at 3 and 9 o'clock the visibility was a major issue and there was hypotony and after that after i was very sure that the iol was in its place i pushed the iris back and then i put the lenticule and i closed it and then i after this i put a heel on here over the glide remove my superior stoma and then i put the lenticule and then gently remove the glide and superiorly pupil was slightly deformed because it had some synechia and left the thing like that i'll show you the post ops this is a third case who had come to us with a history of corneal trauma and i could see a glass foreign body lying in this patient so i went ahead and i did first a peco in a sense i have done a rexes here you can see i am nudging the glass foreign body lying in the angle area and i first remove the glass foreign body yeah this is the glass foreign body coming from the angle area then went ahead and did a conventional phaco put the iol and this is when i'm inserting the iol and then after that went ahead and uh, did the dissect conventionally in the proper manner so these three cases i just want to show that they were different scenarios and um, with pro- judicious use you can uh, go ahead and manage these uh, tough cases also i'll show you the post up of these cases this is the case again I, i since this technique works best in my hands so i have not even tried to change it mm, i usually use 7.5 to 8 mm donor lenticule and uh, push it through the lens glide and it has worked very well so i do not have any extra rebubbling rates or anything like that and this is what i will show you the uh, the post up of these cases 
this is the case which we sh I showed you. Yeah, so this was the case which I showed you, which had a bullous keratopathy. You can see the haptic is lying over the iris. Uh, I was not sure about the PC status. This is the pre-op corneal thickness, which is 761 micron. And this is the post of 636. And this is the post of air society. This is another case of eye syndrome. And this we have tried to show that there are a lot of these uh, iridolenticular adhesions which are present, shallow AC, cornea is decompensated, and I could remove a retroconeal membrane, did a DSEC in this patient, and at one month post-op, I could get a clear graft, and patient has a vision of 6-9 in this case. The, there's another case uh, which I'm trying to show you is of NIDDK, the video which I showed you. This is how the patient presented to us. This is, was a patient one month. Now, of course, the clarity is even much better. And this is the ASOCT showing the lenticule is very well opposed to the host cornea and thickness of 79 microns. And this is how the A NIDD KIOL has come in the ASOCT. So this is my technique to go ahead with DSEC in these complicated scenarios. Thank you very much. This is ice. Yes. Yes, we then looked at it. In the cornea, there was an oblique scar at 4 o'clock area. And I could somehow avoid it. I could actually strip the decimates of that. He was an auto rickshaw driver, and he just came to us that uh, some injury he had had. And that's all. I mean, no suturing, nothing. But I could find a faint scar over there. And when I was examining the patient, he had decompensated cornea, early cataract. And only when I did my slit from one angle to another, I could see something shimmering in the angle area. And I picked up, there was a glass fallen body. And then he said that, that the pain in front of him had actually broken the screen. Sorry, say again. Any trick for doing a dissect if ACIOL is in there? ACIOL? Uh, I have done quite a few with the uh, ACIOL in. Now it depends whether you have vitreous accompanying the ACIOL or not and how well the ACIOL is positioned. If ACIOL is nicely positioned, no vitreous, I go with the conventional DSEC like this. And they have done very well. But if there is vitreous, I, IOL is not properly placed, then I would remove that IOL. And I would go with the retrofixated IOL the way I showed you. I do vitrectomy, and then I go with the retrofixated IOL, and then I do a DSEC with that. Any, yeah. any problem if you do DSEC with ACIOL without vitreous? Is there and you are doing DSEC, any make sure that the pupil becomes small. That is one thing you have to make sure. The pupil becomes small and AC is reasonably deep. AC has to be deep to do that. So thank you, madam. Thank yeah, you. we'll go to the. So we'll go to the next topic. So it will be by Dr. Shreya Thati. He's there. Yeah. Shreya Thati. Okay. And she will be speaking on, is there any uh, hope of, uh, ray of hope in corneal calamity? Madam, uh, can we shorten the presentation to five minutes now? Because we have six talks, uh, and in 30 minutes we have to finish this session and we have to hand over the session. Yeah. So can I put the timer, madam? Can I put just the timer for five just minutes? Try, just yeah. make it short. So good afternoon, everyone. So when we see all this type of uh, end stage of corneal pathologies, we always think, is there any hope? Can we save the eye? Can we give some vision to this patient? Let us see a few cases. This was total corneal abscess, and this was total corneal perforation.
but in both the cases perception of light was present and projection of light rays was accurate in all the quadrant and patients were advised for evisceration they were explained about the thysis bulbi eventually but when we did the b scan the b scan was clear so can we give some hope in these cases that was the question in this totally distorted anterior segment with scleral involvement and they require anterior segment total reconstruction and primary goal in this case is to provide the structural integrity by removing the diseased corneal and scleral tissue as we need to use the larger graft so they pose higher risk than the penetrating keratoplasty and the chances of graft rejection failure secondary glaucoma even the thysis bulbi is quite common in this situation so what we can do so the there are certain um, modification in penetrating keratoplasty in the form of reconstructive scleral keratoplasty or large diameter penetrating keratoplasty these are the names given by the scientist in 1980 scleral keratoplasty name was given by the taylor and stearns the technique is similar like penetrating keratoplasty with certain modification and results are technique are not as good as penetrating keratoplasty in terms of visual outcome and for to gain the visual outcome we need to do the secondary procedures pre operative preparation is similar like penetrating keratoplasty the let us see the technique in uh, these cases we have to do the conjunctival peritomy as the limbus is involved and uh, then many times even the mark of the trifine is not possible because of the involvement of the sclera and larger size of the uh, tissue is involved so uh, and in even the invisible anterior chamber is there so it is very difficult to even mark and enter into the anterior chamber so with all precaution we have to do it very carefully and we have to excise complete total disease scleral part also the next step in this is the uh recipient button um, recipient button uh, preparation and this can be done in various met uh, the method so when in case of corneal abscess where there is fibrinoid membrane it can be removed uh, from the iris surface or and on the pupillary area without damaging the lens and iris diaphragm with very carefully with the blunt surface and synechias were removed with the st stiff swab iris repositor and even the blunt corneal scissor and in infected cases after removing the uh, this infected material the proper wa thorough wash of the anterior chamber is given with the appropriate antibiotics many times while removing the synechias there is distortion of the iris and which requires the iris reconstruction as you are seeing in this case so we can reconstruct the iris by tenzero proline suture which has straight needle during the surgery also we have we face the um, um, cataractus lenses in this so we can manage very easily the cataractus lenses uh, by small uh, open sky technique in uh, soft cataract we can do it without even uh, um, without dilatation patient these cases they are having the pupil, small pupils so without dilatation also we can uh, manage these cases but in hard cataract we have to cut the string we have to do the string tot on one minute more please. yes graft suturing is similar like the penetrating keratoplasty sometimes it is difficult to uh, manage the um, sclera to corneal suturing angle management is uh, very difficult and very crucial in these cases lamellar dissection is pr uh, pr uh, preferred as it prevents the angle uh, structures the post operative complications can be managed in the form of in case of the cataract we can perform the phacoemulsification and even the manual sics with care taken for the um, preventing the damage to the corneal endothelium post operative secondary glaucoma is quite high percentage which is seen and this can be managed with the trabeculectomy and most of the cases the trabeculectomy doesn't work so we have to go for the glaucoma drainage device this case was large anterior staphyloma and while doing the keratoplasty there was spontaneous extrusion of the lens iris diaphragm and patient become anaerobic and aphakic and trabeculectomy was failed and this case glaucoma drainage device was placed in the inferior temporal quadrant as the superior part was conjunctiva was not healthy in this case so graft rejection failure is very common in these cases as 
large graft, there is a corneal scleral graft which comprises the immune privilege status and there is delayed started of the steroids as the cases are infected in origin. Suture related problems are also again very common because of the close vicinity to limbal vasculature which uh, prime concern to stimulate the graft rejection. So in conclusion, progressive corneal uh, destruction of various causes, we require to do the reconstructive keratoplasty in combination with the other procedure to attempt as an alternative to enucleation, evisceration or spontaneous thysis bulbar. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we can yeah. turn all these cases with this meticulous surgery, very uh, challenging surgery to this seeing eye or we can save these eyes. Thank you. Thank you, madam. So we have uh, the next topic from the from Dr. Harminder Singh Dua. So he will be speaking on amnion assisted uh, conjunctival epithelial redirections in ocular surface reconstruction. Well, good afternoon and, yes, and thank you very much. Just a little simple tip for those of us who do limbal transplantation, whether it is autologous or it is uh, living related. So let's, uh, what happens when you get an uh, epithelial defect where the limbus is involved? Sometimes the conjunctiva grows onto it and you get conjunctivalization and signs of stem cell deficiency, which we want to avoid. So if that conjunctiva is threatening to grow or has grown, you remove it. And because you have to remove it sequentially every day, every other day, it's called sequential sector conjunctival epithelectomy. On the topical anesthesia, as a slit lamp, you can use a crescent blade or a dry swab or anything that will help to remove the cells. So here's an example. You can see this epithelium is healing uh, from the limbus. It's coming in, but this conjunctiva is growing in here, and it actually grows on the top. So at this stage, one can brush it away, or even at this stage, one can brush it away. But if it grows on the top and you let it do that, then you get conjunctivalization of the, corneal epi the cornea and you get a problem. So that's called uh, sequential sector conjunctival epithelectomy. If the conjunctiva has already grown, and then you can see over here there's late staining, you can scrape it all off, allow it to re-heal from below. That is the new line of junction of the conjunctival and corneal epithelium. Pupil is intact, uh, pupil is covered with corneal, you get a good result here again. All that is covered with conjunctival epithelium. You scrape it all away, let this grow and allow, and you may have to keep scraping the conjunctiva till this grows across the visual axis, as you see here. Conjunctiva is coming in, and now you've got good cover here. But what happens in the situation where you have uh, a living-related or autologous limbal transplant? So here what you see, cement burn, peritomy 360 degrees, clear cornea underneath, two limbal explants, and then from the limbal explant, this is day one, nicely staining, this is the donor site. You can see that cells have started to grow from below and above. But this is the key point. As these cells are growing in, the conjunctiva is also growing in from both sides. And if the conjunctiva comes in, then you have a mixture and you'll have a problem. So what you have to do is this SSE, you have to, under topical anesthesia, keep scraping away these cells from here and here so that the corneal epithelium can move in a circumferential manner and repopulate the surface of the cornea. And you can see how once that is done, the conjunctiva cannot grow, it heals, and this becomes this, you get a very good outcome. But SSC has certain disadvantages. You have to keep the patient in, you have to watch the patient daily, put topical anesthesia daily, and there can be some discomfort or pain and sometimes bleeding. So like I said, we invented the technique ourselves. It was very popular and we found less improve on it. So this is what we do. We take, uh, if this is the affected eye, you take away all the fibrovascular panis and do peritomy. Then you take the donor uh, from the other side or from a living relative. There's three millimeter of conjunctiva you stitch or glue there and there. Now this much conjunctiva is open. This conjunctiva cannot grow, but this can grow on. If the bed is not nice, you can put a little amniotic membrane on the inside, which is irrelevant. But the main step is the next one where you take a large sheet of amniotic membrane 
and you put it underneath the conjunctival edge so that this conjunctiva is forced to grow on the membrane not on the cornea surface so it will no it will has it has no chance to mix with the stem cells coming or the stem cell derived epithelium coming from the explants so here's an example you can see we've done that there are the explants there and you can see over there the the outer membrane this is day one and you can see all the conjunctiva is now grown over here so in two weeks or four weeks you can take out the outer membrane if it hasn't fallen off itself and you've got healing keeping the conjunctiva completely away because the outer membrane has redirected the conjunctival epithelium away from the corneal stroma. So you can see this is pre-operative, fluorescein stain, non-stain. This is after the ASA technique. We had a little uh, membrane inside and the large one outside. And then you can see the conjunctiva is growing on the outer membrane over here and here. It cannot go from above and below because there you stitched it to the conjunctiva. And then four weeks when the outer membrane starts to come off, as you can see here, you end up with a nice clean surface. Of course, there's stromal scarring here, which will need another procedure, but the ocular surface is reconstituted. Here's a patient with a very severe, extensive ocular surface papilloma. We treated with mitomycin, treated with interferon alpha, eventually ended up like this, 360 degree, uh, stem cell deficiency, very irregular rough cornea. So we treated him with Acer. So those are the explants and the outer membrane was the dried membrane. You can see it's staining with fluorescein, uh, but you can see through it. And you can see the epithelial cells are growing from the explant, this sheet here and this sheet over here. So you can see right through this dried membrane. And when you take it off, see how nice and clean the cornea because the cornea is only covered by corneal epithelium. You can put this membrane, send the patient home, come back after one or two weeks and you'll find there's no chance of admixture of corneal and conjunctival epithelium. And this final case here, pre-op, lots of non-healing epithelial defect, chemical burn, that's the cornea pre-op. We did Acer, this is with the outer membrane, st outer membrane still on. When the outer membrane is taken off, you can see the patient's 6-9 vision in four weeks and that's how this patient looks. So this technique, uh, is very uh, s uh, sequential sector and conjunctival epithelectomy is a good technique, but if you're doing a limbal stem cell transplant, you have to do amnion-assisted conjunctival epithelial redirection. The principle is any epithelial cover for the cornea is better than no epithelium. So if the patient comes straight after a chemical burn, let the conjunctiva grow because otherwise the cornea will melt. And limbal corneal epithelium, of course, is better than conjunctival epithelium if you have that option. SSE can prevent or treat conjunctivalization, but the ACER is to prevent conjunctivalization associated with limbal stem cell grafts. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. It was a wonderful uh, presentation on this. Uh, so any questions, sir? Sorry? Uh, we, have, we, have, uh, uh, we haven't edited any video. But there are, it's, it's, uh, we can send you some, I think. We'll have to send you by email, yeah? Okay. So the next, can we go to the ne next topic will be by Dr. Aditi Agarwal. Uh, she will be t uh, talking on management of uh, ocular surface diseases. Let's be practical. A very good afternoon to everyone. 
uh, it's a pleasure to be a part of this wonderful gathering. Uh, we are going to talk about uh, how to deal with ocular surface diseases. Very basic things. We're not going to go into anything uh, very advanced or complicated. So well, when we talk about ocular surface diseases, we know it's like a vast, vast ocean. And there's this whole hierarchy of ocular surface diseases, which includes the very basic ones, starting from blepharitis, meibomian gland disease, also the demodex these days, which is really causing a havoc and dealing with them is uh, becoming an issue at times. Allergic eye diseases like VKC with a shield ulcer and a plaque, the gelatinous limbitis that we see, persistent epithelial defects, chemical injuries, including the acid uh, attack victims that we see, the alkaline injuries, the acid attack victims especially, you know, are the difficult ones to treat. They need a lot of psychological support along with the other medical management that we carry on for them. So uh, going ahead with the, from the chemical injuries, it's the severe dry eyes like in SJS and OCP, and of course OSSN, which is becoming much commoner these days. Uh, in OSSN, one has to know and decide as to depending upon the location and uh, the amount involved, whether one would like to go in for a medical treatment, a surgical treatment, or a combination of the two. When we come to uh, the functional effects at the ocular surface, it's very important to know that uh, the clinical signs are very common to most of the diseases. So once you uh, evaluate these patients properly and look out for some specific clinical signs like chronic punctate keratopathies, filamentary keratopathies, recurrent erosions, PEDs, infectious keratitis, melts, management would become easier if one knows what to look for. Uh, so we have to understand what is the basic ophthalmological assessment and it includes a proper assessment of the facial skin, the periocular skin. So you start doing a broad daylight exam without doing a slit lamp first, then go on to the slit lamp examination looking for every part, the lids, the lashes, the puncte, look at the meibomian secretions, the tear film quality, look at the tear film breakup time, puncte staining of the cornea, Look at the bulbar conjunctiva, starting with look for any shortening of fornices, that would be the earlier signs that one would see. Look for keratinization, pro presence of symblephra. Look for the cornea for any focal wetting abnormalities. Evert the tarsal, I mean evert the lid, look for the tarsal conjunctiva. Do a Schirmer's with without anesthesia, test the sensations, and of course do a rose wing all stain if no surface stain is found with fluorescein. So uh, once the assessment has been done properly, and the functional effects have been established, it is then very easy to go straight and hit at the bullseye by doing a proper strategic uh, uh, involve, uh, following for the patients. So the most important is to eliminate any exacerbating factors like you'll only use preservative free eye drops, remove any kind of glaucoma preservative medications that the patient may be on, shift him to the non-preservative ones, treat the blepharitis, the eyelids, the adnixa, look for uh, absolute uh, uh, protection in the form of lubrication for the patient might need to go for punctal occlusion but again punctal occlusion can sometimes be a double-edged sword so we need to be very careful here almost all of these patients will have a bad ocular surface inflammation so proper use of topical steroids oral steroids anti-inflammatories maybe oral immunosuppressives may be needed managing persistent epithelial defects is again very important because if you don't manage it on time you might land up in melts you might land up in microbial keratitis and many other things Therapeutic contact lenses work very well for patients like SJS and other patients of severe dry eyes. In the surgical management, we have many, many options now. There are newer options coming up by the day. We now have slit in different forms. We can do a cadaveric slit in an acute case so that you know you can at least tide off the crisis and then go ahead and do a proper slit again. You have mucous membrane grafting. You have minor salivary gland transplant depending upon the case. I'll just end with this one short video where uh, it's a case where there was a very bad uh, vascularization, panels, the cornea was barely seen. So first, of course, we do a peritomy and the vascular panels covering the cornea is totally excised. Once the proper excision is done and uh, you've exposed the surface, put an amniotic membrane graft over it, secure it properly with the help of fibrin glue. And once you've secured it well with the fibrin glue, you take a limbal biopsy from the contralateral healthy eye if you have one at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is just like at the time where we're putting the amniotic membrane. Trim off all the excess with the help of Vana scissors. And then take the donor limbal tissue, held it gently, 
section it into eight to ten small pieces with vanas, or you may also use a Teflon block and cut it over that. It depends upon the surgeon comfort at that time. And these are typically stuck in a circular fashion, in a circumlinear fashion, with the help of fibrin glue. And at the end, one could just put a bandage contact lens. So when you have a contralateral healthy eye, yes, autologous slit works very well. When you don't have, you may need to go look out for a donor, maybe a sibling, but then you have to put the patient on a immunosuppressive. Thank you. So just one question can I have uh, uh, for the live donor you are talking about. Uh, uh, so it's better to have a sibling or sibling. You do you do matching anything? Maybe? No, there's no matching at Not all. Required. You just use a sibling, but you have to have an oral immunosuppression. So any blood like group no. uh, will be fine? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely yeah. all right. Nothing. So the next topic will be uh, by Dr. Dalia. Is it there? Yeah. Dalia said, uh, she will be speaking on management of acute uh, chemical burns. Can you connect mine, please? Mm -hmm. I need your connector here, yeah? Dalia is weed dish, no? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> threatening, then check the pH then don't forget to put topical anesthesia and put a speculum so you can irrigate the eye. And there are so many different ways of irrigating the eye as seen here in these diagrams. But if you don't put topical anesthesia and the patient is, squ is squeezing, then nothing is going inside the eye and then the patient is not being irrigated. Then check if you can and remove any debris because that if there are any debris, they will continue to produce the chemicals. And then after doing all that, you have to recheck the pH again after 10 minutes because even if the pH is neutralized, it can change again in 10 minutes. The best is the diphotherin, which is a, 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 a amphotheric chelating agent which binds to both acids and alkazes, and, and you only need 500 milli of these diphotheric solution. The advantage of diphotheric solution is that it can chelate the uh, acids or alkalis out of the cells, not only uh, wash them. Then uh, af if you've done your irrigation and you still, uh, the pH is not neutralized, you can do actually a paracentesis to add another one and a half unit of reduction in the pH, or you can inject buffer for safe solution into the AC. Then once you've done the initial wash, you need to assess and grades, ocular, so, uh, the lids, the cornea, the limbus, and the conjunctiva. Very important to have a, a properly maintained ocular surface. And this patient, uh, for example, you have to do multiple lid procedures before managing the ocular surface. Otherwise, no, whatever you do on the cornea and ocular surface will not work. The then after you've done that, then you have to ass classify the burn. You need the classification because it's very, very good prognostic technique. The ROPA hole is the initial classification based on the limbal ischemia and the, uh, and the amount of visualization of the iris uh, vessels. But now we've got the DUAS classification, which is much better prognostic classification than the ROPA hole because there is the concept of the use of the conjunctiva to maintain the ocular surface. For example, the drawback of the ROPA hole is that you cannot cross overlap between the different grades and also it was established before the concept of stem cell uh, transplantation has been there. For example, this is an example of opahol grade 4, another example of opahol grade 4, and you can see clearly the prognosis of those two, the two different cases are not the same. So that's why you need the dual classification. Once you've assessed the ocular surface, you have to assess the rest of the eye, the iris, the pupil, the lens, and don't forget the pressure. And sometimes you can't measure the pressure. You need the tonal pen because of the surface is irregular. And even if sometimes with a lot of lid problems, then you can't, you, you have to also uh, rely on your digital palpation. May, we've lost so many uh, uh, patients with chemical burn due to pressure than ocular surface. So you spend so much time trying to reconstruct the ocular surface and you forget about the pressure and the patient ends up losing vision from glaucoma. So remember to check the pressure. Now, once you've done that, you need to control the inflammation. You remember you can use the steroids preservative free in the first six days and after four weeks because that's the time where there is it, it does not enhance collagenase activity. You need your antiproteases. The sodium citrate is very important. We give it hourly in the first week or so, and also oral tetracyclines to prevent melting. Ascorbates are very, very uh, 
painful to put so we don't use drops of ascorbate but we use uh, uh, oral ascorbates up to two to four grams per day and you need the ascorbate otherwise the collagen synthesis does not happen because the ascorbate level goes very low in the stoma uh, wi uh, with chemical burns so that's why you need your oral ascorbates then you have to facilitate wound healing by artificial teeth autologous serum and other growth factors don't forget to use broad spectrum antibiotics. We use it preservative free four times a day. And if you're using vidriatics or cycloplegic, don't use, uh, don't use phenylephrin because it will increase your limbal ischemia. Uh, remember to use anti-glaucomas and with the anti-glaucomas, avoid adrenergic agonists such as brimonidine because they will cause, uh, uh, they will not uh, cause collagen shrinkage and they can affect the uv scleral outflow. So when do you use surgery in the acute stage? As Professor Du has said, we can use sequential sector conjunctival epitheliotomy if you have an area of surviving limbus because you want the cells to go from the surviving limbus and not from the conjunctiva. That's only if you have a surviving limbus. But when do we not use, and this is how to show that the patient eventually settles down with only conjunctal valization outside the pupillary area. But when do we not use SSC in acute stage? If you have a patient like this with no surviving limbus, then you want any conjunctival epithelium to go on top of the cornea. So you don't do SSCE and allow the conjunctival epithelium to go on the cornea because any epithelium is better than no epithelium. And uh, and that is an example of the patients where the conjunctival epithelium has gone completely and sometimes conjunctival epithelium can re-differentiate into corneal epithelium and we've seen that happen and the cornea clears. Uh, in also in acute stage, you can use an amniotic membrane. There are these omni lenses or the Procara, which are available. And if you have a patient in uh, a high dependence unit like this patient, you can use the dried amniogen or the frozen amniogen or one of the, the ones that are available off the shelves. And you use hooks and you can put, a f once you put the amniogen, you can put some fluids to make it soft. And then it's very important to put a conformer so that the lids don't stick together and uh, you don't get a simplification because managing the ocular surface becomes much more difficult if uh, you have simplifone. If uh, the amnion doesn't work, like in this patient, you can take an autoconch graft from the other eye if it's a unilateral case. And we have seen that this has worked very well to reco uh, reconstruct the ocular surface. So remember in acute stage management, your first age measurement, wash, 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 then pH. Prevent any further damage and assess and grade so you know your prognosis and you can tell your patients, control the inflammation and facilitate healing by lubricants and other growth factors and surgery it has, has some role in the acute stage. Thank you. So we'll go to the next topic uh, outright. It will be uh, by Dr. Rasmi Deshmukh. Is she there? So uh, please come, uh, we, she will be speaking on CXL protocol, which is best for my patient. So we, ha we are already into the next session. Uh, so the Dr. Tushar, you have to finish off in three to four minutes. <laughs> so you can finish off in three minutes, three to four minutes, it will be better. Yeah, please. Dr. Rohit, stop. Next, next session. Yeah, no? So, last topic CXL protocols, but. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Today I'll be talking on cross-linking protocols, which is best for my patient. And I'll just skip through the basic things so that I finish it in three to four minutes. 
So we all know that collagen cross-linking is mainly used for corneal ectatic diseases, and the current indications include corneal ectasias, infectious keratitis, low myopia, and even in bullous keratopathy, people have used it. This is the overview of the protocols that we can discuss. The Dresden is the standard protocol, uh, the original one. Then we have accelerated transepithelial, customized cross-linking, cross-linking extra, and PAC CXL, which is used for infectious keratitis. So first is the Dresden pro protocol, which we all are aware about, in which the epithelium is scraped, but it takes almost one hour because there's 30 minutes of soakage and 30 minutes of exposure. Uh, the average reduction in the MRSC is up to one diopter, and reduction in K-max is shown to up to two diopters, but it has a lot of disadvantages like scarring, haze, and infection, and also significant post-operative pain. So uh, coming to accelerated protocols, it is based on bunsen rusko law which states that a photochemical reaction is proportional to the total energy dose, irrespective of the time. So which means that if we increase the intensity, we can reduce the irradiation time, and still the surface dose dosage will be same. There are enough number of studies which have compared accelerated versus conventional protocols. And then the question comes, is faster protocol the better? So it has been shown that standard cross-linking, that is the Dresden protocol, has greater effect in terms of the reduction in the maximum keratometry values. But in terms of functional vision, accelerated and standardized protocols are almost the same. Then coming to transepithelial, it is particularly useful for thin corneas and advanced ectasias, where we need to preserve the epithelium to preserve that 50 microns of thing. But there, is, uh, there are challenges with intact epithelium because riboflavin being a high molecular weight volume uh, a molecule, it cannot penetrate intact epithelium. It's also hydrophilic. So uh, we need substances like EDTA and benzalkonium chloride to kind of form, uh, increase the permeability of the epithelium. So in this protocol, we soak the uh, uh, epithelium with riboflavin, which has penetration enhancers every two minutes, uh, which causes epithelial loosening and improves the penetration of riboflavin into stroma and then UV radiation is given. The advantages are that because the epithelium is intact, there is more patient comfort, less chance of infective keratitis postoperatively, and it has also been shown to reduce intraoperative corneal thinning. But the disadvantages are that because there is an intact epithelium, the oxygen diffusion is less, which is very important for cross-linking to occur. And the depth of stromal demarcation li line is approximately 200 microns versus 300, which is seen in standard protocol. Then whether to use continuous light or pulse light is another question. So this question comes because UV illumination has been shown to deplete the oxygen in the riboflavin soaked cornea, which is very important for photooxidation, that is type 2 reaction to occur. But in pulse uh, protocol, we have one second on and one second off cycle. The total energy remains the same, but the total duration is double. And this is one study which showed that there was deeper stromal penetration as well of the riboflavin, but the functional outcome was same as the continuous therapy. So when it comes to protocols for progressive keratoconus, first we should see the thickness. If it is more than 400 microns, then epi of cross-linking can be done, whether Dresden or accelerated protocol. Uh, if, it, if the thickness is less than 400 microns, then either transepithelial cross-linking or epi of with hypoosmolar riboflavin solution. Then coming to customized cross-linking, the rationale behind customized cross-linking is that keratoconus is a localized disease, which has been shown by Bruno microscopy and FEM uh, finite element modeling. Uh, it has two patterns available. It can either be in sectoral pattern or concentric ring pattern. And the idea is to have maximum energy over the area of maximal thinning, which is around 15 joules per centimeter square. And as we go peripherally, the amount of energy delivered is reduced. And the central point in concentric ring is usually on the highest point on the posterior float, according to the pentagram. And then coming to extra procedure, which is done uh, in conjunction with the refractive procedures, which decrease the strength of cornea. Uh, usually after refractive procedure, there is a chance of ectasia and also refractive regression. More susceptible people are the ones with high refractive error, the, those which have thicker flaps and those undergoing recorrection procedures like repeat procedures. So after flap creation and laser ablation, the bed is soaked for around 60 to 90 seconds and uh, the riboflavin is washed off. And then the UV radiation is given at 30 to 45 milliwatts per centimeter square for 90 seconds. The idea is that the surface dose should be exactly half of what we use for keratoconus, so around 2.7. And lastly, PAC CXL, it stands for photoactivated chromophore for infectious keratitis. So it has been shown that when riboflavin and UV irradiation are combined, it kills microbes, it also arrests stromal melting and reduces inflammation. Um, we can use either Dresden protocol or accelerated protocol, but the important thing is to kind of um, clean the edges around the infected area and freshen up the epithelium and then do the cross-linking. 
and various studies have shown that it it acts better in uh, bacteria and acanthamoeba but not so much in fungal keratitis but there are few studies which are still happening so to conclude there are expanding indications and customized protocols uh, are the recent evolutions in cross linking and it should be individualized based on the condition being treated and these individualized protocols optimize the procedure and make the results more predictable thank you very much thank you very much dr rashmi thank you sir uh, so we'll be out right we'll be going to the next topic it will be by dr tushar grover he will be spe uh, speaking on evaporative dry eye what is new this is the last in the session good afternoon i'll try to be ac as, as quick as, 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 as i possibly as quick can as possible, yeah. so i'll um, i'll skip through the introduction because we all know the significance of dry eye this is the original classification what is important is that the recent tfos dues to classification has stressed that it's not just distinct aqueous deficient and evaporative entities there is also a good amount of overlap and a good comp good number of individuals suffer from mixed dry eye and 60% of the patients that we see in our clinics with dry eye are those having evaporative dry eye secondary to ngd and about 10% of them have a mixed component this is the vicious cycle of dry eye let's i'll skip this in the interest of time uh the important thing is when you're evaluating a patient with evaporative dry eye always go from the most non invasive investigations towards the most invasive investigations because one investigation or one form of evaluation does affect the measurement of the other these are questionnaires that are widely available now most of them are validated and they're all extremely useful in documenting the symptoms that a patient has and also following them up over time what i use most commonly is the osdi but you can use any of them and they all work quite well there will be some specialized tests that i'll be quickly talking about no financial interest in any of those this is the tear lab osmolarity kit which is basically an objective measurement of the tear film osmolarity so the tfos due to report has also stressed on the tear film osmolarity quite a lot the issue here of course is sometimes the repeatability of the measurements and you you don't get to differentiate between aqueous deficiency and evaporative dry eye another important tool is the uh, inflammatory dry which basically measures the mmp9 levels in the kit uh, in in the tear film so what this is going to tell you is if there is inflammation in the eye based on that you can decide if you would like to include steroids or other anti inflammatory medication in your regime again the disadvantage of this is that it's not going to tell you if the inflammation is because of dry eye it will tell you there is inflammation that inflammation could be because of vkc could also be because of infective conjunctivitis or any other thing so you have to diagnose dry eye on your own not with this lipiview 2 is something i'm sorry the slides are cut so the lipiview 2 is something that we use what this does is one important thing is it gives you interferometry of the tear film so there are other interferometers available as well they all work quite well so what you have on the left is an individual with a very healthy looking lipid layer with a nice lipid layer thickness of more than 100 nanometers what you have on the right is somebody with a thin lipid layer and a dull lipid layer with a lipid layer thickness of about 39 nanometers so this is somebody with evaporative dry eye and it also gives you these partial blink images and you get these meibomian gland images so when you have somebody like the individual on top having healthy looking uh, meibomian glands whereas what you have below is somebody with a lot of gland dropout so that is somebody with probably long standing meibomian gland dysfunction so the management is to basically break the vicious cycle bring back the homeostasis of the tear film that has been lost warm compresses manual lid uh, expression is is a is does it does form the mainstay but the issue is you're not sometimes getting that temperature because you're giving those warm compresses from the external surface of the lid but your meibomian glands start towards the inner surface so you're not getting those temperatures the vector thermal pulsation that lipi flow has does bypass that what it does is it gives heat from the inner surface pressure from the external surface it's about a 12 minute cycle there is literature that supports its efficacy as well there are quite a few studies now but a significant disadvantage is a cost it's a very very costly procedure costs about 30000 rupees for one sitting to the patient and again uh, i would not advise lipi flow or any form of Uh, expensive treatment in somebody with a lot of gland dropouts because that's somebody who's not going to improve with any treatment that you give them there are other available modalities as well such as these heating ipads that are available this is something called mebo thermo flow and i've used them and symptomatically i do believe patients are better but there is not much literature to tell you how effective they are and how long the treatment actually lasts another important thing that is being spoken about very widely there is literature to support it also is intense pulse light but the original publications by toyos's group had stressed on the limitations and on the safety of and efficacy in pigmented population so how much it works and how safe it is for our population is something that we need to find out more and we need more studies from 
the Indian population for this. So to conclude, aqueous deficiency and evaporative dry eye are not always exclusive. There is a good amount of overlap that exists. Whole range of diagnostic instruments available. Some of them quite costly. Some of them do add value. It's really up to the practitioner to see what they find useful in their practice. A large range of possible solutions as well. Most of them quite useful, but you have to weigh the cost benefit and you also have to see what kind of a patient base you have. Thank you. Thank you, Tushar, for finishing it very fast and very crisp. <laughs> being you, very crisp. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you to all the speakers for this session. So we'll hand over the session to the, uh, to the next group, please.